What you got there? This is our route this week. We will have traveled 1,710 miles when the week is over. Whether you are telling your story as a man, um, make sure to think about who are your female characters in the stories and are you writing them in such a way that it reinforces damaging stereotypes that have uh, proliferated through film throughout time or or how can you tell stories that work to disrupt those things hey naomi you rock thank you thank very you much. so much for having me all right, all right. imagination. Again, this is, nobody likes this one, but just lift your chin a little bit. I'm not looking up your nose. I'm just like, okay. I'm looking. Okay. I always like to check this area for people who have a lot of fire like you do, because it shows the health of the heart. Okay. We look at the heart emotions here and we, so just this little tiny area, uh, the septum tells us a lot about that. So yours is good and healthy. Okay. Remember when you push down your anger that we we're talking about? especially when it's a nat nat or natural gift. You know what the other side of anger is in Chinese medicine? It's passion. Mm -hmm. So you can't push down that coin of, of anger without pushing down your passion for life. Mm -hmm. And you're getting up there and you're doing it and you're saying it, but there's more. And you know there's more because the more noise you make and the more attention you get, the more people might come at you, right? And I think you're worried about them destroying you. No, you're worried about destroying them. <laughs> You won't, okay? You're going to teach people and you're going to help people. So. so, in episode two, we touched on the fact that we were doing marketing and that that was part of our strategy, but this episode we wanted to dive deeper and tell you more about exactly how we're trying to market this film. So our marketing focus is divided between getting butts in seats for the local screenings, events around the country, and then also pushing, making sure to push the national story, the national sales, and the online sales, which are, is obviously a huge part of our overall goal and strategy. Okay, so let's start with the local screenings. How do we get people to leave their houses and know about this so that they come to see the movies? So in each location where we're screening, we have one official local host wherever we can. We have printed materials, both posters and flyers that the local host can distribute around town. 
four weeks before each screening, I create an evite that we forward to the cast, crew, and investors. Wherever possible, we rely on the theaters to market to their customers in advance. We do paid Facebook ads for each screening in the two weeks leading up to it. We were pursuing local marketing trades with local businesses. We've been reaching out to local interest groups. We were pursuing radio ticket ad spot trades. And we have been aggressively pursuing local press. The keystone of the local screenings has been our local hosts. We have one designated local host to help spread the word in their community. They get a host packet that explains everything, like all sorts of things they could try to do. Those hosts, God bless them, have been the, definitely the biggest driver of getting people out to see the movie. There's no question. About four weeks before any given screening, I create a local evite, and that goes out to a list that is all of our cast, all of our crew, and all of our investors, so that they can very easily forward them along to anybody that they know in those specific cities. Because when you're doing this many cities, it can be easy to forget that you know people, but if you get those specific invites, you're, you're, you go, oh yeah, I do actually know those two people in Tucson or whatever, and you can forward them. Then we rely on the theater. Not all of the theaters are willing to do this, but if they invited us or if we just, if it's sort of a warmer, more collaborative relationship, they will often help us market it. And that, I would say, is in the top five reasons why somebody comes out to see the movie. For two, the two weeks leading up to most screenings, um, we run, we paid Facebook ads for people geographically specific who also hit our other demographic needs. And this has proven to be remarkably successful. Of all of the reasons that they come where they don't know the host or one of us, Facebook ads is number one. Then I had what I thought was this genius plan <laughs> to do a local marketing trade with local businesses. So in the beginning, we would write to a local crystal shop, a local comic book shop, any local businesses that seemed to intersect with what we were doing. And we would say, hey, if you do one social media post advertising our screening and include us in one of your e-blasts, we will do the same thing for you. And I made it so simple. I created this beautiful Google form where they could just input their information. We had all of our information ready to go. And that hasn't worked at all. So we axed that plan. We have ceased, we have, we're not doing that anymore. We've been re reaching out to local interest groups. So if there is a local Harry Potter club, if there is a local vampire movie fan club, that has been moderately successful. I would say not hugely successful, but, but the times we've, it's worked, it's really worked. Meetup groups. <laughs> have proven to be very, very effective because you've got a group of people who are explicitly looking for reasons to leave their house and hang out with people. We, we heard that, that local radio stations might give you ad spots in return for tickets to your event that, you could, that they could then raffle off to their listeners. We tried that for a while, that did not work, so we've given up on that plan. We were pursuing local press very aggressively at first. And we, we actually hired somebody specifically to, to do that. And that has been shockingly unproductive. Um, what's frustrating about it is that the times that it has worked, that we have gotten a piece of radio interview or a piece of press, it has worked phenomenally well in getting people out. The places where it has worked has been either when the theater has a direct connection to the press organization and they have gotten it for us or when the local host has a connection and they have gotten it for us. But in terms of cold emailing and calling local press, it was not working, so we're stopping that. <laughs> okay, so then <laughs> there's the national side of our marketing campaign to drive the online sales and try to boost the overall momentum of the tour. We have been paying for Facebook and Instagram ads. 
We have been paying for YouTube ads both to push the trailer and sales of the film and to push the docuseries. We've been reaching out to national interest groups the same way we have with local interest groups. We have been trying to contact influencers and get them to post and write about the movie. We've been using my post-screening email strategy of trying to get every audience member who comes to see the film to tell five friends to also watch the movie. We have made this docuseries. We have just made the decision to hire a national PR firm. We send weekly e-blasts sharing the new episode of the docuseries and also telling people where we will be that next week. And we have our social media stream running, posting once or twice a day, sharing news, information, and encouraging people to buy the film and merchandise. So here is the giant, giant problem with marketing movies that has been created by iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play, which is that unlike the local marketing, where we can in real time find out what is happening and what is working in every screening when people come in, we're like, oh, hey, how did you hear about the movie? And we hear, oh, a Facebook ad. Oh, I know the host. Oh, I'm Naomi Grossman's cousin. <laughs> Naomi Grossman has had a lot of cousins somehow that have seemed to come to this movie. Go Naomi Grossman. We don't know <laughs> how many people still have bought the film on iTunes, Amazon, or Google Play. And we will not know for between three and six months. So yet another reason that Seed and Spark is the greatest is that they do give you your numbers every month. We knew we wouldn't have those digital numbers until after the tour, but the reality of what that would mean for our ability to make marketing decisions really sunk in this week. We got our marketing report back from Digital Limit, our first one on the first month of the tour. And the the overall number of people that the ads reached were way lower than the estimates. Your fix right now is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey they just wanted to make movies. <laughs> Our models were based on those ads reaching 18 million people, which is what we had calculated with Digital Limit ahead of time as would be the reach of those ads. Now, what we began doing as clever marketers was that we began targeting those ads more and more specifically to the types of people in terms of age, interest, demographics that seem to be responding to the ads. Presumably, the marketing got better and smarter and reached more specifically the people who would buy, but it also substantially reduced the number of people that it would reach. The other decision we made was to siphon some of that original Facebook ad money to the local screening ads, which again reduced the overall number of people because, again, it's more specific. It's another reason that it becomes more specific. So here's where not knowing the purchase numbers becomes a really giant problem. Because if my original model said, okay, 18 million people will see the ad, an X number of those people will buy the thing. And in reality, a smaller number of people will see the ad, but a higher percentage of them will buy the thing because the marketing is more targeted to those people, then this isn't a problem. But we don't know. <laughs> and we're not gonna know until the tour is over. That is pretty terrifying. First of all, what a great re representation uh, of the real vampire community. And what I really loved about what it what it really brought is that anytime somebody tries to do a, like a, a really good representation of our community, they leave out all of the the goofy humorous bits. This like showed like in blood. Everyone yeah, wants to see the. This blood. showed the humor too. This showed that, that they're real people, and real people tend to be real goofy. And, and more than just for notions of our community, I thought the film was just really well done. It's, it, it stands on its own, regardless of subject matter. This is the award.
more that, of course, I made don't know that. Uh, that is for the best feature film, Bite Me. Thank you so much. So we run the uh, Austin Vampire Ball yes. here the week before the Halloween weekend. And, um, I learned how to feed on energy and identifying with this archetype of a survivor, someone who lives even when life has become a living death. That became an inspiring archetype to me and coupled with my ability to feed on energy, it saved my life. Bite Me is great progress. My only slight disappointment with it, and I emphasize it was only slight, is that it was kind of incomplete because some of the stuff about Cyvamps, which was in the original script, apparently got cut out of the movie. So overall, it portrayed these people as real people. It's, it's a really, really important movie about tolerance, and I love it. question I think a lot of people have for vampires is, do you drink blood? Are you, are you offering? I am not offering. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> yes, I do drink blood. Yes, I, I am someone that believes in embracing multiple paths. Uh, and as we discussed earlier, there are multiple paths to feeding for a vampire. You have an energy vampire that can take directly the energy from one person or ambient energy from a crowd or the uh, sexual energy produced from arousal, doesn't have to be sex, just the energy from arousal, or the sanguinary vampire that can take the energy from blood. And I believe in embracing all of those, and I do. I have a live-in donor, uh, my girlfriend, Alona, who is absolutely wonderful and beautiful, and my wife, Daly, and I feed from her uh, regularly in all of those various forms. And uh, I think that if you are a vampire and you are capable of doing such to embrace all paths to create a balance and because you can't always get that one thing here or there but if you just kind of blend it out so know. so can I come over for brunch sometime absolutely <laughs> for a bloody Mary oh. <laughs> for a bloody Mary <laughs>